So here, here for me is the really fun part because we get to kind of like, you know, what's that next level going to look like? And basically, we're talking about, hang on to your seatbelts, we're talking about going from the fourth dimension to the fifth dimension. Check it out. We're going to the fifth dimension. So what in heaven's name am I talking about? So here we have to do a little bit of math. I know, I know you ladies will love this, right? Uh, Alexis might enjoy this. So we're, what is a dimension? Right? If we're going to talk about fourth and fifth, what is a dimension? A dimension is defined by the minimum number of coordinates needed to specify any point within it. Does that make you glaze over? Nope. And uh, it's pretty simple. So a dimension is defined by the minimum number of coordinates. So a coordinate, like say we have an x-coordinate, goes like this. There's your x-coordinate. That's the first dimension. So if you're talking about the first dimension, you're talking about points and lines. And then we go to the next picture, which shows it pretty clearly. Here's the second dimension. You have both an x-axis and you have a y-axis, right? Cool. Now you can make a circle. And then if you really want to get wild, right, have an x-axis, a y-axis, and then a z-axis, and you can have a sphere. Cool. Check it out. So and those are the dimensions that we mostly think that we know about and talk about. But the fact is, those are all abstract dimensions. None of us have actually ever encountered those dimensions, because they're all outside of time. Everything that we know of as reality is actually the fourth dimension, which is another the additional dimension. You have an x, you have an x axis, a y axis, a z axis, and you have a time axis. So you have spheres and cubes and bananas moving through space and time. Right? And that's the fourth dimension. That's where we live. That's, that's the whole world as we know it. And it's a world of fundamentally dualities. That's how we negotiate. That's, that's just like you have a Mercator projection for a map. We use dualities to sort our way out, right? So there's- That's our cultural set. Though. Exactly, okay. yeah. But, it, but it's basically fourth, it's fourth dimensional navigational stuff. So there are men and there are women. And there's up and there's down. And there's space and there's an object. And it's great, it keeps me from crashing into stuff. It keeps us able to tell each other apart, not get all confused. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a phenomenal system, just like th those dimensional systems are phenomenal also. But it's, as you can see, just like Anne's cartoon, well, if there's a first, a second, a third, a fourth, oh, there must be some more dimensions. And if you really want to get fancy, mathematicians will take you all the way up to the tenth dimension by so Noah can rattle off with each, and it's just, I, I'm just, I'm not, and that's too abstract for me. I start to lose interest. I'm really just, I just know that the fourth dimension, which is the realm of dualities and the realm of limits, and the fact that, you know, think of what makes computers go, right? Binary code. Yeah. It's all binary. The whole universe as we operate it is all, and the problem is it's a world of limits. It's a world of oppositions, mm -hmm. subject and object. It's a world basically of war and okay. scarcity. That's where yeah. it takes you. That's the end result of the fourth dimension. And you ultimately realize we can't live here. We're going to die if we stay in this. So the question is, in heaven's name, does the fifth dimension look like? And here's where you mostly have to go, the physicists. So this is a guy named David Bohm, who was an American uh, physicist, one of the leading theoretical physicists of the 20th century. And he said, the notion of a separate organism is clearly an abstraction, as also is its boundary. Underlying all this is unbroken wholeness. Even though our civilization, like the word civilization, is developed in such a way as to strongly emphasize the separation into parts. It's really that simple. It's, it's, it's always been whole. It's always been whole. It's just our way of making sense of it is to divide it up into, into, into parts and bits. So this guy's an amazing, beautiful, beautiful visionary. And, uh, and that's really what we have to do. We have to, get, we have to get rid of those separations. And that's why you know, the whole emphasis on transgender and all kinds of, you can see this fifth dimensional awareness beginning to seep in or come in through the cracks. And to me, it's so interesting that uh, Leonard Cohen died the week that Trump was elected. You know, and Leonard Cohen's greatest song, right? You know, let all the bells ring, forget your favorite offering, your perfect offering. There's a crack, there's a crack in everything. And 
that, I don't like it. Right. I want to add one thing, which is that separating everything is what you do when you learn how to put a clock together. Yes. First thing you do is take it all apart yeah. and understand how all the parts work and how they relate to each other. So it's an essential part of it. Oh, it's a huge, part. exactly. This isn't the disc the fourth dimension. Yeah. It's, it's, but recognize it's a developmental phase. Just like as a doctor, you, you, you take your cadaver apart, but ultimately. Right, right. Yeah, that isn't what Alexis is doing with her patients, right? Cutting them into little pieces. You know, it's just that's, that informs her holistic vision down the road. So we need to recognize this fourth dimensional perspective is a developmental phase, just like living in the ocean was a developmental phase. That actually each one of us went through when we were in our mother's womb as we yeah. lived in the ocean. So really, I think it's, again, we come back to Einstein. And I'd invite, starting with Ishana, Ishana, read the first sentence, and then Alexis, read the second sentence. And a human through. being is part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. Now Alexis reads the next He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion in his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our own personal desires and perfection for a few persons. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Whole of nature and its beauty. So, so that's basically fourth dimension to fifth dimension. And the thing is, it's not just like it's so easy to have these things sink into like you know Hallmark card platitudes and let's all love each other. It's like no, no, no. We have to do this. Just like Tiktaalik had to leave the ocean or he was gonna freaking die. We have to do this now. There's no other way. We can get smarter and faster and everything and hoard our stuff and make fortresses. None of that is gonna work. This is, we're basically being pushed, like being born into the fifth dimension. And the problem though is it, it it's invisible to most people uh, in this reality. This seems like nonsense. So really, to sum up the fifth dimension, it's basically realizing that everything is unbroken wholeness, movement. It's just, it's one. It's unity consciousness. True unity consciousness. And then, can I add one more Please, thing? please. Um, I, I believe from what people have studied about the early nature of culture, which began, of course, before you picked the down in D.C. or earlier, the world was seen this way. Yes. It only was unconscious unity. Exactly. And everything spoke. I mean, law, trees, brooks, clouds, bugs, everything was alive. Everything spoke. Everything had a voice. We were all part of it. We were, un, we were unable to be broken from it. Yeah. Under the, under the mother. Yeah. And then when the father took over, the father began to break it down to pieces. So yeah. what we're trying to do is get back to it in consciousness. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So here's the Ishana made a beautiful, beautiful animation that kind of sums up how this whole thing works. You know, and that, that's so you, you hold everything in a yeah. place of love. Yeah. And it really, it's the mother. It's like you have the mother's love for everything. You know, that un, which basically means unconditional love. You just love everything because it is. And, and everything you interact with is from that place of love. Including ourselves. Oh, of course, it's got to be. We're part of it, too. Very, very important. Um, so the, then the really big question is, how do we get there? This sounds good. It's beautiful. Wouldn't we all love to love everything and everybody all the time? But how do we get there? And really, to me, it's very, very simple. It's really, it's about evolution. And I think, uh, so, so we're going we're gonna to step back, take a big, broad view of things, uh, this guy, Brian Swim, who's a mystical cosmologist. And just, I invite you to just sit with the sentence for a second. This is the greatest discovery of the scientific enterprise. It's a pretty big statement. You take hydrogen gas and you just leave it alone. And after a while, it turns into rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. 
So right. that's a fifth dimensional perspective, right? I mean, that's just unbroken wholeness. You just take hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is how scarce in the universe? Everywhere. Every star in every galaxy, 99.9% are made of hydrogen gas, and it's all mostly because of love. You know, and I love if you take, this is really the whole story of evolution, and it's interesting to think about, if you even just, just look at the word. And it's just, oh, you can just take a breath. It doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything, but it also means we're part of something so much bigger than we can imagine. And look what it's doing all by itself. Right? Phenomenal. So this is me. I like to take ideas and play with them. So this is, uh, this is me riffing on Brian Smith. <laughs> yeah, Bodhisattva is someone who recognizes that until everybody, until all sentient being, beings are free, nobody's free. You know, it's, it's just like the Marines, no man left behind. You basically say, I, I may be enlightened, I may be free, but I will keep incarnating life after life until everybody is free. And again, we typically say, yeah, right, when, when snowballs freeze in hell, right, when pigs have wings. But it's, you know, it's when rose bushes flower on earth. That inevitable, and this is where we. Ha but but if you're stuck in a fourth dimensional perspective, that isn't going to ever make sense to you. And this is where we have to go. One of the crucial fifth dimensional concepts that we have to accept or work with, or at least be willing to consider, is reincarnation. Which is, you know, it's very very hard for us to accept in the West. And what we don't realize is actually reincarnation was a cornerstone of Christianity for the first quarter of its life. It wasn't until 553 uh, in the Roman Empire that, her that uh, the concept of reincarnation became a heresy. It was an integral part of Christianity for the first 500 years. In fact, if you read the gospel carefully, when Jesus and John first meet, you meet each other, they're having this wicked sense of deja vu, like we know each other, and which one of us was the teacher this time? I know one of us was the teacher last time, and one of us was Elijah, one of us was Elisha, and they had this little moment. I mean, that's in the conventional gospel. And, it, you know, it's, it's people zoom, zoom over it, but it's, it's reincarnation. You can't, that, and this is where we really need to come to, what an incredibly complex piece of biotechnology we are. We just don't, we just don't realize um, that it's taken four billion years on this planet for us to evolve. And of all the species that ever lived on Earth, 99.9% of them have gone extinct. And essentially, they've gone extinct in the large part to create us. We are the most evolved, most complex piece of biotechnology on this planet. Um, and we just don't, we don't really, we take it for granted. We say, okay, what's next? What's next? And it's like, holy, well, we have no idea. And this is where the concept of reincarnation, and the thing is, which if you start studying enlightened masters, they all talk about reincarnation. As matter-of-factly as we might say, it's about 117 right now, because we've got about 45 minutes left. It's like that matter-of-factly. They all talk about it. To my mind, it's just like if six independent spiritual systems say, look for these situations, huge upheavals, worth renewal coming, it's like pay attention. If all the enlightened people talk about it matter-of-factly, who am I to say, okay, you guys have it right on these areas, but here you're totally screwed up, right? I mean, it's just, it's arrogance. So, it's really helpful, and this is like what Amma talks about, is that each lifetime is one sentence in a novel. You live your whole life, period. You're dead. Now it's time for the next sentence. You know, another way of looking at it is go to a movie. This lifetime is one frame in that entire movie. Or what I like, so like simple things, is you know those flip books that have like maybe a guy chopping wood, you know? Each lifetime is just one page in the flip book. Brrr. You know, we're so, this is it, this is all I've got. It's like, no, it's not. You just get over yourself. You're one page in the flip book. <laughs> you know? 
That's it. That's it. And then you begin to realize, if you have that, it's just like Groundhog Day. If you have enough time, bit by bit, you can work through, okay, I'm going to try being a rich tyrant. I'm going to try being a rapist. I'm going to try being a slave. I'm going to try being a mother. I'm going to... And after a while, bit by bit by bit, you get closer and closer to what you really are. You don't think that's sort of the universal unconscious which carries us through without having to reincarnate? Um, again, it isn't, I'm just telling you what they told me. But Buddha, I mean, as, almost as a requirement, like, you know, you have to take certain tests, pass certain tests to get your license. Under the Bodhi tree, before Buddha got enlightened, he had to experience all of his several thousand previous lifetimes. It's almost like taking it, you know, okay, you pass that test, now you're ready. And they, Maharaji talks about it, Amma talks about it, Jesus talked about it, they all talk about it. So it's not like whether it's necessary or not, it's how it is. I mean, we can all agree, what a wacky idea for a planet, right? But there's a wacky idea for a planet on about 19 different levels, right? But this is just a feature, reincarnation, and it, it's a completely fifth dimensional concept. It's recognizing that the soul doesn't ever, the body, like a suit of clothes, wears out, wears out, wears out. This idea of wanting to live to 200 or 300 years old is ridiculous. In fact, it isn't meant to last that long. The soul, however, is immortal. And all the enlightened beings agree on that. So if they all agree on this point, and they're enlightened, you know, it's like Einstein was a vegetarian. Think about it. Right? Um, you know, if all the enlightened people agree it, and it makes sense. It's, that's what gives us time, because this is so complicated. What, our biological endowment is so complex. I mean, even think of us when we're born. We're so complex. We're born way premature. Any other species born in our condition that we're born at when we come out would die immediately. But because we're so complicated, nature had to balance the requirements of the mother. We really should stand there for another year, right? But that would kill the mother. So we have to be born premature. But that's just the first foreshadowing of how complicated we are compared to other species. And we can't just do it in one lifetime. We need multiple lifetimes to begin to realize that all that fourth dimensional stuff is just a box in a prison. Because it's endlessly fascinating, endlessly distracting. It's like, how do you keep a moron entertained, right? Let him loose in the fourth dimension. So we move on. Love acorns. I love acorns. So this essentially is the young human soul. This is the basic seed. This is the heart fully surrounded by the ego, fully encased in the ego. And for the acorn, the most important thing for this acorn is, is its mood, right? That's the most, that, that fails too soon. That's the end. There's not going to be an oak tree, right? So that, that's, that, carrot, that, that shell, the cap, have very important jobs. Don't let anybody in under any circumstances. And eventually, you get the right circumstances, moisture, a certain amount of warmth, things happen. But at this stage, this is the stage <clears throat> that the majority of human beings are in right now. Yes? It actually paints the Buddha's face on it because that looks like his head with all the snails. Oh, left yes. Yeah. See, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see Trump. I see Trump's kind of like orange hair, dude. Yeah. And you can, have this, you can see the eyes and that kind of... And the ruddy complexion. Mountain, the, ruddy, the mouth. Like, that's true. And like, so in our world, the dominant mindset or paradigm is who's got the biggest, shiniest acorn, right? And Donald Trump, right? Look at my acorn, Mar-a-Lago, Trump Tower, my million-dollar suit. I am such an incredible acorn. I am a huge acorn. You know, and... You know, people are, a lot of people are offended by it, but he's able to pull that off. And this is where most of us are. This is fourth dimensional. It's all about appearances. I am a man. I am a handsome man. I am a handsome, intelligent man. I am a handsome, intelligent, powerful man, right? All those things that we identify ourselves with, that's all the shell. And we're obsessed with my clothing, my identity, my appearance, my presentation. That is paramount. It's paramount. And think of how quickly we judge people based on that. We're all stuck in this perspective. And we, we're like little kids. We don't realize, <clears throat> yes, this is hugely important for a very, very short time. It's crucial. Without that protection, oak trees would go extinct. But after a very short time, and most of the time, what we want to see is this. Now, how about this shell now? Right? You're not going to sell that on eBay, right? No one wants to marry that, right? What a freaking loser. <laughs> and like, what the hell is going on with this? That's disgusting. Stop doing that, right? 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 You know, that, that, that's when you, your life becomes intolerable. 
And you have to you start melting down. That's adolescence. That's midlife. That's spiritual awakening. It's childbirth. And suddenly, this becomes less than a relic. It actually becomes a deadly impediment. And if it doesn't get fully out of the way, it's not going to happen. So this is a very awkward, very vulnerable phase. And most acorns don't ever get past that. Um, and then after a very short time, and all of a sudden, what's that entity's agenda compared to that? Right? This is the dominant paradigm on the planet. This is civilization. This is the pyramid. This is all about status. It's all about the fourth dimension. It's all about power, control, status, accumulation, keeping your barriers. It's all about walls and fences, separation. And now, radically different agenda. And the two can't really talk to each other. This guy has got one plan, this, or this, whatever sex you want to call it. It wants to get as much sunlight as it can, and it wants to drop as much moisture and nutrients as it can. And it's got a completely different purpose. And this is basically after you've had some kind of spiritual awakening. You know, you're suddenly, you have a totally different reason for being. You're still very vulnerable, but you're going through that. But if you give that enough time, look at that. Woo! Yeah. Is that a real tree? Yeah, that's an oak tree. And that feeds the whole forest. That tree feeds everybody, right? From the smallest little acorn boring bug to the biggest bear and all points in between the birds, the rabbits, the rats, the, the mice, the skunks, the deer, the turkey, everybody is fed. All the countless insects and microbes and lichen that live on that. So that being feeds everybody, feeds the whole forest. And it's quite so it takes care of itself. I mean, oaks have a lot of tannin in their leaves. And one of the reasons, look, nothing can grow underneath it. So, you know, it's a little bit like Knocko Bear says, you know, do no harm, take no shit, right? You've got to protect yourself. You have to maintain your integrity, but then Okay, no, that old trees like that will revere again. Yeah, of course. Any culture with its head up its ass. You know, right? We have a sure name, which, rep which represents that holy oak. Right? Yeah, holy oak. Yeah, exactly. So it is. It's the holy oak. And it's that's every single human being. Give it enough time. Not, it's not some human being. It's not a few human beings. That's all you got to do is make the cut. And people forget how hard it is to make the cut, right? Because in a single ejaculation of a fully motile man, 300 million sperm. At best, one of them gets in. Um, and if you had a lottery with those odds, no one would buy the tickets. Even Powerball, which is, you know, the, the biggest, the best, the baddest, is 80 million to one. So just by having a body, by virtue that you have won a lottery on the order of magnitude bigger than Powerball. And you contain, if you pay attention, the potential to be that. So this is the world that we're trapped in. All the fears, all the concerns, all the fighting that's going on is over these terms. About how much money I got, how much territory I got, how much status I got. We're going to fight and we're going to die for that. And you don't realize it has nothing to do with it, what's inside. What's inside is that. Well, the job of the oak to keep everything out, to protect it. So that, that's what we're For a about. short, yeah. short period of time. It's a brief, brief, just like the fourth dimension was a crucial evolutionary phase. Not, we're not dissing the fourth dimension. Crucial to get to this point. It has to be discarded, just like the shell of the acorn must be discarded. And then there's a whole other reality. And of course, it's preceded by these very vulnerable, awkward, scary phases to go through, which in a world of you know, dip, you know, hungry things around you, you're very vulnerable. You're very vulnerable. But if you persist, life after life. So we can have some, then the bottom line is we can get discouraged. Now, humans are never getting there, but it's like when you plant seeds, they don't all germinate at the same time. There's always a couple that come up first. So just like with the acorn, there's a couple that got there first. And here's, some, here's the earliest historical example we have, 2,100 years ago, the Buddha. Hatred does not cease by hatred, but only by love. This is the eternal goal. Now, there is a great counterintuitive to the fourth dimension. That's a fifth dimensional point of view. You want to heal hatred? Bring love to it. Only love will heal it. Is that really 2,500 years ago? Yeah. So he was the first, you know, I'm sure there were other folks who got, but he's the first one in history. Then you jump forward to 2,000 years ago, you have this spell on, right? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's another fifth dimensional concept. My neighbor is no different than me. And who is my neighbor exactly? Anything outside me? Another fifth dimensional concept. Then we can move 
forward into this, into the Turtle Island here, uh, the white buffalo calf woman, right? Omataku Yesen, all my relations, all my relations, not just my human relations, right? My four-legged relations, my stone people, standing ones, the creepy crawlies, are all my family. And it's the same thing Mother Teresa said, right? We draw the circle of the family too small. Right? And it's just like Einstein was saying, it's this optical delusion that like I'm only related to two people in this room plus my wife and maybe my friends. Right? It's everybody. Everybody. And then we come to Ama, right? Who feels that everybody and every living creature is her child. And she loves them with that kind of love. And not all of us have met someone like this, but there's a beautiful, beautiful description in this memoir of Krishnadas where he tells the story of what it feels like to be with a person like this. Because I think this is really um, uh, important. Because most of us haven't had the privilege of meeting someone like this. It's fully, fully living in the fifth dimension. There's a great story about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism. Baal Shem Tov means master of the good name. He had been hiding his spiritual light, but the time had come for him to reveal himself in the world. Another rabbi, Raf Naftali, was traveling home from a wedding and stopped at the inn that was run by the Baal Shem Tov and his wife. Baal Shem Tov took his horses and gave the rabbi a strange smile. He asked if he would be staying with them for the Sabbath. And the rabbi got upset because the Sabbath was four days away, and of course he would not be staying in such a rustic, out-of-the-way place as this for so many days. Every day the rabbi would leave the inn on his way home, only to get very confused and suddenly find himself back at the inn. On the day before the Sabbath, he left again, determined to get home, but on this day he had a total meltdown. He saw that all beings suffer terribly and had no way of freeing themselves from their pain. He saw that an abyss surrounded all beings, and none could cross over to touch or be touched by another being. Everyone was completely isolated in their agony. The rabbi's heart was crushed, and he began to get angry. And I think this really, when we're, we're going back to the very beginning of the PowerPoint, you know, are we at an evolutionary leap or are we in this total shithole? You know, and it's, it's how much when we pick up the newspaper, it's all beings suffer terribly. They have no way of freeing themselves from their pain. There's an abyss surrounding all beings and none can cross over to touch or be touched by another being. Everyone was isolated in their agony. I mean, we get that message again and again and again from the media, from political leaders, from our and a lot of us feel trapped in that place, that kind of bad, especially like on a bad day. The rabbi's heart was crushed. He began to get angry at God, and then he had a vision. A man appeared. Of course, it could easily be a woman. Doesn't you know? I'm, this is I'm just reading what's here, but that doesn't have to be a man or a woman. A man appeared in the midst of all this suffering and filled all space with love. All of the beings in the world clung to him, and seeing themselves through the eyes of his love, were joined and found comfort. The world. When he opened his eyes, Rabbi Naftali was back at the inn and realized that the man smiling at him and holding the reins of his horses was the man in his vision, the Baal Shem Tov. And then Krishna Das goes on and said, This is how a real guru works. We see ourselves and each other through his eyes and the eyes of total love. And in that love, we are free from our darkness, free from isolation. You know, it's like, uh, anyway, just, just like as mammals, we need a mother to nurse us. We need, at that certain vulnerable stage, we need to be loved in a certain way, or we're not going to develop. And the acorn needs sunlight and moisture and nurturance to get it to crack open. We, as individuals, need to meet a being who is in this place, who can love us and look at us that way. I mean, one of the great lines from the story of Daganawida, who was a similar figure, um, and Hiawatha, who at that point was a confirmed uh, cannibal addicted to it, Realize, he said, he sees himself in Daganawita's eyes and he says, I did not know I was like that. I did not know I was like that. And that's really what each one of us needs. We need to be, I'm not just an acorn who has to worry about competing with other acorns and being eaten by the rats and the squirrels. I do not know what I am. But we don't, we, we need, just because we're mammals, we need to be nurtured by someone else's heart, by a certain type of being. That's why, for me, why I'm so excited about Aman Maharaji. Because they're the same genetics as me. They're no different than me. But they've cracked out. They've figured how to get out. And they shine on me in that way. And that helps me to crack out. And that's, it's that simple. 
it's, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't require special education or any technology. So like that. So that's why I'm fairly optimistic. So bottom line, stepping back again, looking at the whole world, 5,000 years ago, there was this wacky little experiment. Like if you were to fly by the planet 5,000 years ago, and you'd, you know, you'd cruise around the Earth in your little spaceship, it's mostly green, there aren't very many humans, the ones that you see live in very small groups. There was this weird little thing starting to happen on the edge of the Mediterranean. And this is Eridu. This is considered to be the first city on the planet. Eridu. Eridu is a Sumerian city. And here we're, this is, a, this is about five or 600 years into the experiment. This is about 2,500 BC. But this started around 3,100 BC. And it's, you know, you can start to recognize, that's quite familiar. This is the template for how we live. And who would have guessed flying by 5,000 years ago? I mean, keep in mind, this is very vulnerable, right? The, the right kind of disease or the right kind of drought hits, and this thing gets extinguished permanently, right? Very fragile. Who would guess that in 5,000 short years, this thing, wham, would surround the planet to the point where Agent Smith in the Matrix can talk about how humans are like a virus. We replicate without thought for our host. We just eat meat. Just the only other organism that does that is the virus. It's not humans who are the virus. It's not humans who are the cancer. It's this type of social organization. It's this type of consciousness, which is a disease. We now have it's now become a disease. We have to break out of it, or we're going to poison the planet. So again, let's go to. 1987, we're doing a flyby of the planet, and you just happen to fly by the south coast of India, southeast, southwest coast of India. This is heroin, right? This is Amma's ashram. And it started just a few short years before this. It was a, a mud floored two room hut. And when she was 16, she told her dad, You know, one day, dad, people are going to come from all over the world to visit me here. I'm going to be lunatic, right? I mean, what if our daughters told us that, right? I mean, maybe, sure, but you know, have a backup plan. Um, it's now this vast, you know, ashram with a s network of, of hospitals and housing and, and um, universities, and she's crisscrossing the planet. So, might not take 5,000 years, but this could easily, just as easily as Eridu, right? Just as easily, this could be foreshadowing, and you've got to give it time, just like planting the seed. That's why it really comes back to seed. So in closing, it really, we all need to ask, this is just my particular point of view of the elephant. You know, and this is the question that we all need to be asking ourselves. What, what comes next? What is the evolutionary leap to paradigm shift? I wish I could get a witness. One of these mornings won't be long till it's for me and I'm gonna go and up again and take the thing and try to be a pilot.